It's My Right Stuff with your host, Grammy Award winning record producer and inventor, Toby Wright. Is brought to you by Tones, a natural sleep and sound healing portal available globally at www.tones.com. That's www.tauhoms.com. I'm your announcer, Grinnin Barrett. Here's Toby. All right, and welcome back to My Right Stuff. I'm your host, Lord Toby Wright. And today on the podcast, we have two very, very special guests. Milton L. Brown and Steve Dorff. These guys, in case you don't know, are country music legends. They're a songwriting team that have like really too many hits to rattle off. I'd also like to introduce my co-host for the evening, Mr. Gareth Dighton, aka DJ Chunky from Chunky's Choice Cuts. Hi, Gareth. How are you? Hey, hey, Toby. Sydney. Uh, very well indeed, my friend, and a very warm welcome to you. Uh, and thank you, as always, for the invitation to come and join in with this uh awesome uh podcast and like i said i'm very interested to catch up with these people just because well they're incredible people really legends like you said royalty almost absolutely and uh so it seems the history of these two gentlemen is very deep i'd like to have them start at the beginning and introduce themselves and tell us how did all this begin ladies and gentlemen hi milton hi hey, steve okay. welcome hey. to my right stuff how are you guys doing today doing well, good bye. thanks good Thank Excellent. Hi guys, welcome aboard. Hey, Pleasure to have you on board with us. So tell me, how did this amazing partnership start over 50 years ago? Jeez, 50 years. <laughs> Sorry to put the number on there. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, well, we were, I was in Atlanta, Georgia, going to school, going to the University of Georgia, and uh, I signed with a publishing company there, a music publishing company in Atlanta, and the guy, uh, who was in charge of the songs and put, you know, pushing the songs and plugging the songs, a guy named Cotton Carrier told me one day that uh, the consensus was that I was writing really great melodies and uh, terrible lyrics. And he said, coincidentally, I've got a guy who from Mobile, Alabama, who's writing great lyrics, but terrible melodies, maybe the two of you <laughs> together. And, um, and that's really was the beginning. That actually that's sounds excellent. like a marriage. Well, it could have. Yeah. Just imagine if I had thought I was supposed to write the melodies and Steve was supposed to write the lyric. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that would have been really ugly. Mm. We well, might not know well, each of you. Well, the one question I'd like to ask is, well, how do you guys actually sort of keep it going, really? Because like I said, it sounds like a marriage, and most marriages don't last as long as you guys have actually been working together. Have well, you ever reached a point where you've kind of thought, I can't do this anymore, I've kind of had enough, or is no. there always enough interest in the pot to keep you going? You know, every collaboration is different, and and mm -hmm. with, uh, uh, the, I think w the longevity of Milton's in my collaboration is due to the process of how we write songs. And yeah. I would say 95% of the time, the lyric has come first. Uh, Milton sent me a lyric and I just do the music to the lyric. So he slaves over it for about two, three weeks. I have him rewrite it for another two or three weeks. And then I write the melody in 10 minutes and we're done. So <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's been really, uh, I think I'm joking, of course, but I, but I think our process and, and the way our collaboration has worked over the years has kept it fresh and kept it easy to not have to be in the room together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I would say, you know, venture to guess 80% of the songs we've written over all these years, we haven't been in the room together. But wow. some of the, some of the really like good it. ones happened when we were together. And another interesting thing is we could be together working on a particular song 
and end up with a song that was created when we got together and had nothing to do with what we sat down to do. Yeah, that's yeah. happened. I'm thinking mm -hmm. particularly of some of the movie stuff that uh, it just happened that way. And what Steve said is well, that's actually part of the organic what, process. What Steve said is true. I except he said I'll slave for a week or two. I might slave longer than that. And he says I can write it in ten minutes. No, he can write it in <laughs> one minute. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> one minute wow okay uh, yeah, one thing of, and i forget the name of this i wrote it down somewhere but there's a thing about people who are born hearing melodies and steve part of what he he has told me and it's in his book which by the way he wrote a book called i wrote that one too and if you ask me i'll tell you the funny story that came with the title but uh from the time literally he remembers being in his crib and hearing melodies when he went to his first baseball game they played the game to a melody he was hearing in his head and he thought everybody did that but that's Steve. wow yeah no i i would uh, i i had this imaginary orchestra in my head from the time i can remember and no matter what i was doing whether it was sitting in my mother's car to the windshield wipers tapping on a rainy day to a friend of mine running around the bases at a little league game which milton's referring to i would be underscoring what was going on and i would ask friends or even my mom i'd say how did you hear that and they'd look at me like i was crazy so I just assumed everybody had a little mini orchestra in their head, you know. Um, right. I, I I often refer to myself having my own kind of um, like sort of um, internal iPod. I'd be walking down the street and I hear other people's songs in my head quite often. Uh, so I can relate to that kind of idea. You know, you're out and about and you see something and there's something kind of springs to mind that kind of almost fits that scene at that particular moment in time. And I right. suppose that's part of your like sort of creative kind of almost like sort of organic songwriting process where where you see a scene and you, you're kind of constantly scoring your own tunes to it. Right. That's that's absolutely accurate. That's fabulous. Well, you know, your guys catalog is so massive. I'd like to just pick a few of these songs for today's podcast. Um, one, of, one of them that I remember a lot is Every Which Way But Loose, which was a massive hit. Yeah, it's hard not to remember that track, Toby. That was our first. <laughs> yeah, that was our. That was your what? That was our first number one together. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. So it was made famous by Eddie Rabbit, right? And Correct. then it was recently covered and reintroduced to a new audience by Blake Shelton, right? Can right. you tell me the whole story behind this great hit? And hey, right turn, Gareth. <laughs> <laughs> right turn, <laughs> quiet. Well, I exactly. Um, I. <laughs> Call, uh, I think Milton and I remember this a little bit differently. Um, I'd gotten a call from uh, the, the uh, music supervisor of the movie um, earlier in the day, and he said, I need a song yesterday called Every Which Way But Loose. And I said, what does that mean? He says, I have no idea. He says, all I know <laughs> is uh, Clint Eastwood is in a truck, an old beat up pickup truck driving around fighting people for money and he has a pet orangutan i said oh that really helps and um as, you, and, uh, as actually you do you know yeah, i called milton um <laughs> that evening and um uh asked asked him uh uh if he knew what every which way but loose meant and he of course knew the knew that vernacular knew that uh phrase and we wrote the bulk of the phone of the song as i remembered over the phone i was in los angeles he was in alabama and uh because i had to go in the next day or a day later and play it for eastwood live at the piano and uh and that's oh, wow. really how that happened i hear I remember it a little differently. Basically, what he said is true, but we didn't finish it over the phone. I had to slave away to uh, to come up with the rest of the lyric. And Steve told me, uh, Clint has wrapped the movie 
and he hates the songs that have been submitted. And, uh, and so I finished that song and, and this I do remember, I, uh, I'm in Alabama and they're in, uh, on Sunset Boulevard in LA. And I had to call when Mary Ann, who is Snuff's assistant, this is back before the days of fax or uh, email or in computers. But I called her and dictated the Finnish lyric to her so that Steve would have it when he got to the office. I waited all day because Steve told me, you know, if we can do this, we've got to do it right now. I heard nothing all day long. And I figured, okay, we lost that one. And a phone call comes in the evening from Steve. And he says, you want to hear about my day? And I said, yeah, I can't wait. What happened? And he recounted the whole story. But basically, <laughs> he finished the, I mean, once again, this is a thing I labored over for hours. And what did it take you, Steve, 10 minutes to write the melody to the thing? Because <laughs> he had it. It was so long ago, I really can't remember. But, you know, when the lyrics write, it comes very quick to me. I don't slave over a hot piano. You know, I, uh, it, it just has always come very quickly. So the rest of the that story is Steve said, well, here's what happened. Snuff and I, when I finished it, Snuff loved it. Uh, we were writing that for Snuff Garrett. I don't think we had mentioned his name in full before, but Steve had signed with him and Snuff was producing the world. And when Steve got there, he was doing Sonny and Cher and a whole bunch of artists of the time. And when he was the musical supervisor on this movie. And that was that. Was, oh, okay, that was yeah. our connection. Yeah. So they go, they drive out, they drive to the Warner's lot, and uh, and Clint, uh, uh, Steve's at the piano, and Snuff says to Steve, "Play it for Clint." And there were other people there as well. He played it, and didn't he ask you to play it again, Steve, or or was it just one time that? No, he asked me to play it again after he'd heard it. And uh, I played it and he just looked at me and he said, that's the song. Who can we get to sing it? Yeah. And that's when, ah. you know, and then it was out of our hands. I mean, Eddie Rabbit was, wasn't was even someone I had heard of at the time. And uh, But the record company that was doing the soundtrack, the head of the record company, Steve Wax was his name. He was there. And he said, we have a, a young country artist who's breaking pretty big, this would be a monster opportunity for us, for him. And uh, his name's Eddie Rabbit, and um, and that's who did it. And, uh, you know. That's fabulous. Yeah, tell him about Take Me. Well, why don't we, uh, I, excuse me. I'm sorry, Gareth, I was going to say, uh, tell that was him the story of taking it, to the, taking it to his bus and the wonderful, uh, the way they greet Well. You know, all these stories, I mean, all these songs have long stories and I don't think we have time to, you know, um, if people, if people that see this uh, podcast uh, would like to read the in-depth versions of, of how these songs happen, um, they can certainly um, go, go to my website, stevedorf.com and, and get the book right. there or uh, on Amazon. It's uh, my books on there. And of course, we delve into the trials and tribulations of how these songs, the miracle that it takes for a song to be bo written, born, and then finally get heard on the radio, let alone be a hit. Right, exactly. The truth, the truth, what Milton's alluding to is Eddie did not like the song when he first heard ah. it because he, want, he had written all his previous hits and he wondered why his team wasn't asked to write the song which okay i get it you know and and yes, um, and he reluctantly signed on to do it because i think he realized hey this is a chance for me to you know elevate my uh uh tvq you know to be in a movie and and uh, he right. was smart to do that because uh um it was the biggest record he ever had right well, time and place, why don't we check it? this out? Because I'd like to 
to refresh my memory and hear it again. Oh, very much so, so let's check out this chart busting song here on My Right Stuff, Every Which Way But Loose. I've always been the kind of man who doesn't believe in strings. Long term obligations are just unnecessary things. But girl, you got me thinking while I'm drinking one more beer. If I'm headed for a party, then why the hell am I still here? I'm testing. While you're turning me Every which way for loose You turn me Every which way for loose Inside the fire's burning me In my mind you just keep turning me Every which way for loose Baby there's no excuse to turn me back so many great memories yeah very much so very much um, Thank you. i have a couple of quick questions uh about yeah. kind of writing uh writing for others so how does the writing for other side of things work are you commissioned by a label or a studio to write no no um i mean on on occasion i've uh when it came to television or film i was asked to 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 do something on uh I guess you'd call it commission, but um, uh, more, more, more times than not, it was speculative and they were asking four or five different songwriter teams to come up with that magic thing to hedge their bets. Um, right. I mean, later on now, you know, I, I don't do that. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll be offered a, a movie or a film and we'll be offered the spot and we'll write it and hopefully they'll like it. And, um, but no, mo most of, uh, I would say, you know, most of, most of what songwriters do, most of what Milton and I have done are just, we just write songs that we feel good about. Uh, we feel are great ideas and, uh, we write the song and, and then try to get artists to record them. So that, that leads into my next question. I was going to ask, well, um, do you choose who you actually write for? I suppose these days, yes, you're able to because of your reputation and your longstanding history, where I perhaps imagine when you were first starting out, there was... Yeah, I very rarely have an artist in mind when we write right. a song. When we write a song, we're writing it for us, I think. We're just trying to write a great song. And I yeah. most nine times out of ten, the artist that we might have thought would be good for it isn't the one that ends up, you know, uh, having the hit with it. I mean, when we wrote uh, sure. a song called Lasso the Moon for a movie called Rustler's Rhapsody, um, we wrote it for the character in the movie to sing it because it was about a yeah. singing cowboy. And, and, um, and the record company that was doing the soundtrack or the film company said, uh, hey, uh, how about Gary Morris, you know? And I went, who's Gary Morris? <laughs> and um, <laughs> we ended up having a top five record with Gary, you know, on, on the song. So very rare, you know, a lot of, a lot of the hits I've had, um, you know, the, the artist that I had in mind, the first artist that I had in mind would generally pass on the song through the years, which was a monster hit for Kenny Rogers. Uh, yeah. Passed over by Barry Manilow and Glenn Campbell, both passed on the song first. So, wow, you just never know. You never, you never. I, I don't think we ever know who's going to uh, end up end up with it. One, right. and and sort of finally, in, in um, 
in actually this in, in kind of this sort of section have you ever written a track for someone where you've been asked to or like for a film and then you've written it and thought uh no i'm gonna keep that one for myself that's actually too good to give away no because <laughs> no. if you heard me sing you'd know why you never heard me on the radio um <laughs> and Milton, Milton and I are, we're, we're songwriters you know we're we're not i'm not an artist you know we're we're these anonymous uh, Oz behind the curtain guys that write the soundtrack of people's lives and nobody ever knows who we are. We're not the face of our songs. The artists right. who record, you know, if, if you ask someone, hey, have you ever heard it every which way but loose? 99 out of 100 people say, oh, yeah, I love that Eddie Rabbit song. Right. Right. So, uh, yeah, nobody knows who we are. It's funny how some, uh, apart from us, uh, uh, it's funny how uh, Gareth how sometimes to answer it's close to what you said, but uh, my my phone rings in Mobile, Alabama, and my assistant comes in and says to me, "There's someone on the phone that says she's calling for Sir John Schlesinger." Well, I mean, we all knew Sir John from Yanks and all these great films that he had done. I'm thinking, why the hell would some, why would John Schlesinger be calling me in Mobile, Alabama? It's got to be a joke. Somebody's <laughs> playing a, a, I get on the phone, it, um, this is Milton. At Milton, this is Sir John Schlesinger. I was God, John Schlesinger. He liked my lyrics. He wondered if if I would do a song for this movie he had coming out. And I said, Well, I generally write with Steve Doyle. Yes, I'm aware of your collaborator. Steve would be fine. He's doing a movie called Honky Tonk Freeway. I don't know whether you remember that or not. I won't go into detail. But it's a long and interesting story. Uh, Steve was, what were you scoring, like five uh, TV series at the time? I mean. Yeah, there was a lot going on. Doing a lot. <laughs> Growing Pains, uh, Spencer for Hire. Anyway, he, Murphy Brown. he was busy. And I called him up. I said, you're not going to believe what happened. I told him the story. I won't ramble on on the whole, but basically, uh, uh, we wrote uh, Hunky Tonk Freeway, and he sent uh, uh, a representative over to meet with us. And what Steve had told me, he said, look, I'm so busy. If we can't get a decent creator's fee for this, I'm going to have to pass on it. And right. I said, Steve, you do this all the time. What's a decent creator's fee? And he said, if we can't get like $10,000, that was back then. I mean, there'd be nothing today, but if we can't get a $10,000 creator's fee, well, I'm going to pass on it. And look, Milton, you don't know how to negotiate this stuff. You keep your mouth shut. Let me do the negotiating. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he sends a representative over and that's a story all to itself, but I won't go into that. But anyway, we meet at the Pink Palace, the uh, uh, hotel in Beverly Hills, and uh, for a couple of bottles of wine before the meal, and then afterwards cigars around. And anyway, and then uh, the representative says, uh, well, what's it going to take to have you guys do the song? And I'm thinking, I don't want to lose this chance to write for a Schlesinger movie. Right. And uh, Steve says, well, if we can't get $10,000 for it, uh, I'm going to have to pay us. And the guy he sent was Bob Mercer. I'll call him by name. I don't know whether you remember Bob or not. but uh, Yeah, Bob Mercer. Uh, anyway, so Mercer says, well, that's not exactly what I had in mind. <laughs> And Steve said, well, getting ready to negotiate. He said, what do you have in mind? He said, I was thinking $15,000. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I remember him saying, no, when I said 10000 he said, okay, uh, you got a deal. And then he said, I was going to offer you fifteen, but, you know, which showed what a great <laughs> negotiator I was at the time. So, 
<laughs> got screwed out of uh, five grand because I told Milton to keep his mouth shut. <laughs> That's anyway, awesome. We write the song in the, in the movie that was, we had said, so, oh, Steve, tell him who, who we got to work with in the studio that he said, well, because he was the, going to do it. The was Little the River. George Martin, who produced the Beatles, oh. uh, was, yes. was uh, doing the music for the film. And he came oh. over and met with me in LA and uh, said, I want to do the song with the Little River Band. And I said, great. And he said, and I, I'd like you to co-produce it with me. I, and, you know, so I mean, I'm like flipping out, you know, because I'm a huge, obvious Beatles fan and oh, yeah. George Martin, just, just to get to sit in the studio with him would have been great enough for me. And we ended right. up making so the record up, together. Uh, Milton flew out. We had a, we had a, you know, we had George Martin producing and uh Little River Band, which was one of the hottest acts on the planet at the time from Australia, did the song. Um, about two or three weeks later, I think uh, it fell out because they couldn't get their label to agree to some cross-collateralization thing. So the Little River Band fell out, and we ended up okay. with uh, Russell Smith from the Amazing Rhythm Aces, who actually did a, a great job. And uh, the record right. never really did anything. The film didn't do anything, um, except it was kind of a fun film. It's a, you can still order it on uh, Netflix or one of those s subscription things. So, um, right. Well, so another interesting song because I, I love that one is one one performed by Rex Allen Jr., "The Last of the Silver Screen Cowboys." Can you tell me about this oh, song? Because that one this one means a lot to me. And what, what was the meaning behind it? This well, was a song that Milton and I had written uh, and recorded with Rex Allen Jr. Um, and with Roy Rogers and Rex Allen Sr. And I'll let Milton tell okay. you a little bit more about, about that because that was a Snuff Garrett uh, uh, project that he asked us to write that song for. The fun part of, of the uh, happened later when I was asked to do the music for a movie called Rustler's Rhapsody. And okay. just by chance, the director, Hugh Wilson, who had done First Wives Club, great, great writer, WKRP in Cincinnati, um, who created that. He literally, to show how crazy this business can be and how just the one in a billion chance, that... Um, the album uh, was, he sent the uh, the costume designer for the film to Tower Records on Sunset to find a costume for his singing cowboy in the movie. And she happened okay. to see the Rex Allen Jr. cover with him dressed up like a cowboy. A cowboy, right. Uh, he, she brought the cover to him the album and he looked at the album and he said that's my cowboy and weeks <laughs> later he happened to pick up the album just by chance and say what does this sound like and he listened to the last of the silver screen cowboys and called the head of music for paramount and said i want to hire this guy to do my music for the film and i want this song to be the end title song for the movie excellent oh I was going to say that, first of all, writing for Cowboys, I'm old enough so that my my memories of being a kid was driving, was riding my two-wheel bike to the neighborhood theater to see Saturday movies, one of which was always a, silver, a black and white silver screen cowboy movie. So, nice. The first one Steve and I got to do was for Roy Rogers, who was my all time. Oh my God. When, uh, 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 that one was snuff called actually snuff called me, uh, on that one. And he said, uh, can you write, a, a song for Roy Rogers? I almost fell down. And he said, it's gotta be called Hoppy Gene and me. Okay. Uh, Hoppy is Hopalong Cassidy, Gene will be Gene Autry, and me, of course, is Roy Rogers. I said, when do you have to have it by? He said, I've, 
he called me on a Monday. He said, I'm going to Apple Valley on Wednesday and I need to take the demo to him. Okay. Steve and I got it done. And uh, how long did it take to get it out, Steve? It was not months or years. Wasn't it just weeks? Yeah, we, we went in the studio, recorded it in 20th century, put it out. And uh, this top 10 record, country record. That's great. Last of Silver Screen Cowboys was kind of the, the follow-up to that. He wanted to do something with Rex Allen Jr. and his dad, Rex Sr. Right. And he, Snuff came up with the idea, and Milton wrote the lyric. I did the music, went into the studio with all of them, and uh, it was a great record, fun record. That's great. I, I'd hey. like to take a listen to that in a minute. Go ahead, Milton. I'm sorry. Uh, I was going to say... Uh... Uh, I'm trying to think. That's not the song I'm thinking. Go ahead and 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 Toby and play that, and I'll. This thing was a different song. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Well, I'd love to hear the last of the Silver Screen Cowboys, right here in my right stuff. Last of the silver screen cowboys Last of a fast dying breed Cattle a grazing Six guns a blazing God knows this is what America still needs The last of the silver screen cowboys standing tall for what he believes is right don't push him around cause more than one villain's found that he don't back down from a fight That song Great. reminds me of, uh, uh, sorry, that song reminds me of watching uh, cowboy films with my grandmother when I was a kid. It really does. <laughs> yeah, it just exactly. puts me back there. Be a, it puts me back there being like a idea? six or seven year old with my grandmother watching them on the television. <laughs> so that that's amazing. I, I'd like to get back to the Clint Eastwood connection because Clint, oh, he's a fascinating man. So how, how did this connection happen? And then I have a question about the, the strings and the arrangements and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, the first, uh, the first story was every which way, but loose. And, um, uh, Clint was unhappy with the music that he had. And, uh, he asked me, he said, um, after he heard the song, uh, he said, have you ever scored a, a movie? And, oh. I was immediately going, you know, my brain was going to the word no, because that was the <laughs> truthful answer. But I thought, well, if I say no, and this was all in the speed, speed of a, a millionth of a second, if I say no, I'm never going to get the shot. So out blurted, I've always wanted to. Okay. And he said, well, great, you'll do this and that was the first of five films that I did with Clint. Uh, wow. Billy. Turn that chance down, can you? Honky Tonk Man. Uh, 
uh, Pink Cadillac, uh, and and the sequel, any which way you can. And of course, with those projects, there were songs that had to be written for all of them. And Milton was my go-to guy. And so we had right. a big hit with Any Which Way You Can with Glenn Campbell. We had Barroom Buddies out of Bronco Billy. That was Merle Oh, Haggard. yeah, Barroom Buddies. Yeah, we had Merle Haggard and Eastwood doing a duet that went number one. Uh, we right. had uh, uh, Frizzell and West, who became the CMA duo of the year. We had a big hit with them with another honky tonk night on Broadway. Um, so it was just a, it was just a great Avenue for writing songs and having them just put into movies, you know, big movies, Clint Eastwood. Right. Movies, you know, they don't, it doesn't get much bigger. So that was. No, 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 no. Excellent. So you mentioned barroom buddies and that was quite the song. Um, whose uh, idea was it to get Merle involved? Probably and perform that one. Uh, Sorry, Snuff pretty much called the shots as to who uh, the artists were. Um, you know, he would he would call me or call Milton and just say, "Write this or write that or give us a title." Okay. And a lot of times he'd give us shitty titles. I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> we wrote a couple of horrific songs for some of these projects that i didn't even want to put my name on but we didn't have a choice we were we were hired guns you know uh, right who dat comes to mind <laughs> <laughs> one of the uh, and then i wrote a song i don't know if milton was on this one it was the it was the opening title of of uh any which way you can um because milton and i wrote this great song for for uh, glenn campbell and Eastwood says, no, I'm going to put that at the end of the movie. I want to open it with Ray Charles and uh, and me singing a duet, a follow-up to Barroom Buddies. And, uh, and Snuff calls me and he says, I want you to write a song called Beers to You. And I remember <laughs> thinking that could be the easiest title I've ever heard in my life. But I wrote it and it was the I did not. Horrible song. Milton did not write that one. <laughs> it was a horrible song. It was a horrible record. And it would the whole the whole the whole process was was just wrong. Which, you know, and and um it was one of those things. You know, you get asked sometimes you get asked to do bad stuff. Crazy stuff. <laughs> Right, you exactly. Know. Crazy. At least you're honest about it. Bad. And it was in the movie, and it, to this day it embarrasses me. Whenever I do, you know, I have to turn the sound down for the beginning of the movie. Oh, we'll be sure and circle your credits next time I see it on TV. Right, right. Send you a little screenshot of it and stuff. But, <laughs> but, but we had two monster hits out of that movie, and any which way you can, which Milton and I did write, was uh, was one, and and then Frizzell right. West uh, uh, was launched from that movie as well. So. Yeah, I'd like to check out a little Barroom Buddies because I remember that song briefly. Um, so let's check it out. Here's Barroom Buddies on My Right Stuff. Hey, I want to sing till the feeling gets right. Well, let's harmonize. We'll be dynamite. I hold the high notes, I've done it for years Good deal, old buddy, and I'll pour the beers There's always some lady alone at the bar Yeah, and you always let her know just who you are I know a couple gals that we can call Damn, they'll shake the picture right off of your wall We're, We're barroom buddies and that's the best kind Nobody fools with a buddy of mine I laugh when you're happy And I cry when you're blue <laughs> We're barroom buddies and we're doing fine So pour me another, we got nothing but time Old chug-a-lug-a-luggin', barroom buddy of mine Yeah, that's fabulous. So um, 
I was just going to ask about the arrangements real quick, because I've noticed, you know, massively lavish uh, string arrangements on all this stuff. Did you guys have anything to do with that or was that um, all other people? No, I did them all. I did. I did oh, that's fabulous. The records. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, because they're Steve they're amazing. Great. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah. No, I, I one of the reasons uh, Snuff moved me out from Georgia, where I was living, to uh, to to be his. You know, Snuff Garrett was not a musician. He was one right. of these producers who just knew had an uncanny knack of what could be a hit, and um, but he needed someone like me to arrange and co-produce and musically make make his ideas happen got it okay that's incredible that's, a, that's awesome because i you know the, the string arrangements like i said are so amazingly lavish and stuff that it, it, okay. it just it warms my heart yeah well, but, budget, fortunately <laughs> back then budgets were not uh there were no budget constraints whatever snuff wanted he got and, right. and i benefited from that that helps massively. Yeah, that's excellent. Well, I, I love the Righteous Brothers, too. And how did Bill Medley get involved in the Blue Denim Blues? Uh, I had done an album with Bill. Um, okay. A comeback album called Damn Near Righteous. And uh, uh, I was also a huge fan. And uh, I'd previously worked with Bill on a movie called The Last Boy Scout uh, with Bruce oh, Willis. Okay. And right. uh, yeah, I know that film. Bill sang the... Uh, opening title song which i wrote and um so bill and i became friends and years later uh i heard a song that someone else wrote uh that i played for bill and i said you should record this and he loved it and we ended up doing an album and then um months later after we had finished the album uh milton and i wrote a song called blue denim blues for a, a movie project uh called the motel life um which my son was starring in um oh, and awesome. uh, steven dorf is uh is the actor is is my son and oh. um we didn't get it in the movie but i called bill and i asked him if he would sing the demo slash master because i had cut a really good track on it and uh, okay. bill, bill came in and did it and he loved it and um we ended up on the repressing of the album, Damn Near Righteous, we ended up putting it on the album. Wow. That's great. Mm -hmm. What an incredible story. I'd like to take a listen to that song because it's been a while since I've heard it. Um, so do you mind if we do? No, go for it. I, I love this oh, song. Please do. Excellent, excellent. So, all right, well, let's take a listen uh, to Blue Denim Blues here on My Right Stuff. Down and now drifter, no stranger to bruises and pain. I ain't never had nothing, it ain't likely that I will. They ran out of gravy for I caught that train. Now, this beat up motel. Here's my castle And this back alley Loves my penthouse view My life is a lot About leaving And living the blue denim blues Yeah, I've got those blue days It's all about patches and holes in my shoes They had nothing good about nothing to lose I got the blue denim blues <laughs> oh, I love how you... Man, that was a good one. I, I really like that one. So 
like you guys have an amazingly long career together. And I mentioned the number at the top of the top of the uh, episode, so I'm not going to do it again. Uh, but <laughs> like yeah, literally 50 years, and that's fabulous. Um, and I understand that you have a new song together. Um, we do. We haven't it's stopped. Less than a week old. And oh, uh, no way. Just fin- yeah, just finished the demo, and uh, uh, Milton sent me this lyric he was excited about, and um, and the minute I saw it and started reading reading it, I said, yeah, this is uh, this is a no brainer, and uh, uh, did the music and uh, did the demo, and what you'll be hearing is it is the actual demo recording because. Yeah. Literally, no one has heard this song yet. You guys will be the now first. The cameras are going. That's down. great. A world premiere again yeah. on my right stuff. That's fabulous. Well, so we have your permission to play a little bit of it. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Steve. I think we'd like to give our audience a sneak listen to this one. It's called "Same Three Words." Here it is on my right stuff. When something is right, it doesn't need fixing When it's withstood the testing of time I can leave it alone and just live in the moment Like I've heard it in rhythm and rhyme Cause if it brings a smile when you say it or hear it If it makes you feel good inside Those same three words are still making magic And we're just along for the ride Cause there's no way to write them that hasn't been written No way to say them that hasn't been said Mixing and matching in all combinations But nothing i found that I'd use there instead Heartfelt emotions I've twisted and turned Till it finally hit me what's true Those same three words used over and over mean more when I say them to you Those same three words are still making magic Mm -hmm. Wow I think people are going to love that song yeah, and at the yeah, end, totally. obviously, uh, the same three words are I love you. And and uh, the cleverness of this lyric is you don't hear those words until the very end of the song. That's beautiful. So, yeah, it's very beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Sure. So uh, what's next for you guys? Any dream collaborations that you've not had so far? Oh, a lot of those. Um, just uh, keep doing what we're doing and uh, trying to trying to just uh, keep writing good songs and and getting great artists to record them. That's fabulous. Um, I, go ahead, Gary. Um, uh, uh, sorry. Um, are there actually any kind of um, collaborations that didn't quite work out that um, you would say like the kind of artist that sort of got away sort of type thing? Hmm. I can tell uh, Steve. You can tell the story of writing for Pure Country. Yeah. Well. Well, that was a huge hit, huge success. I'm talking about from uh, our writing together that didn't work. Yeah, Milton. And when I got to hired to do the Warner Brothers picture Pure Country, which was really due to the success with the Eastwood movies at Warner. Um, I got hired to do this movie, Pure Country, with George Strait. And uh, Milton, and of course, and I called Milton. I said, let's let's write some songs. And uh, I had the script and sent the script to Milton. Uh, we wrote two or three really cool songs. And uh, um, 
it was it was hard. Uh, George was very tough. Um, his producer uh, was very tough on the songs. Um, they didn't like any of them, except the director had liked one that Milton and I had written that ended up being sung by another band in the movie called the Cactus Brothers. Um, but uh, I went on to write uh, two songs for the film. I Cross My Heart and Heartland, which were both huge number ones for yeah. George. Um, and he didn't like either of one of those when when uh, <laughs> when the project started. So he kind of did it because the director did love those songs. And uh, right. Um, but yeah, sometimes uh, sometimes it's not it's not all, uh, you know, fun and roses. It's a struggle. Absolutely. I suppose it depends how fickle Actually, other people what, are as well. What happened was Steve said, come to Nashville and let's write for this. We literally wrote for a week. Oh, uh, OK. These are the songs Steve and I wrote. And we took them to play for the A&R guy listening for uh, straight. Steve gave him, but this is back in the days of reel to reel tape. He gives him the tape. He listened to what Steve, 10 seconds of the first song and said, what Steve? Well, I remember that song too. It was called uh, the road that takes you home. And I, I love that song. And uh, yeah, yeah, he just said, George will never sing this. But of course, George, he took, he said that George, he threw, I crossed my heart back to me after the first verse and chorus and said, I'm not cutting a Lee Greenwood out. Um, cool. wow. you know, George straight up to that time was doing what he does. You know, all my exes live in Texas, uh, uh, right. and all those great, really hard country songs. Um, I cross my heart was, was not a traditional country song that you'd expect an artist like George to do. And, right. um, and Heartland certainly wasn't either. So. The rest of the album, uh, which I had nothing to do with the writing, um, were all more traditionally George Strait type songs. And um, fortunately, I had the two monster number ones off that album. And George went from selling about 300,000 albums to selling 8 million <laughs> on right. your country. So, um, wow. That's the power of uh, <laughs> film and television. Yeah, oh, totally, you kind of totally. change your, your tune as an artist after that, right? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, my dog Sorry, my dog knocked the uh the cable out of the wall. So okay. Well, uh, <laughs> did you did you ask a question, Gareth? Uh I did and it was answered. Um Oh, okay. So you guys have so much to your collective careers and so much material and history to it. And I'd really love to do a second episode to fill in all the blanks that we missed, you know, something around that song. And also, um, you know, an, another honky tonk night on Broadway, I understand, you know, but there's tons of stories, right? I'm sure yeah. that every song, every song is its own story and we can keep going and going and going. And, and I'd love to do a second, third and 27th episode with you guys. <laughs> Very much um, so. If, it's if been really, like really interesting. <laughs> When you get to 27, we're going to have to do some more. I, I, might, I, might, <laughs> okay. I might also add that most of these songs I wrote when I was five years old. Um, you know, Milton's just a little old. So, so Milton was 12 and I was five. And, and you know, so, you know. There, it's there, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was still in his crib when we did our first collaboration. He was hearing those melodies. It was trouble talking to him, but the melodies came easy. Is there a medical name for that, Steve? Uh, there actually is. Um, I uh, And I write about it in my book. I, I, um, I've always seen colors with music when I close my eyes. And right. um, I was having dinner with a, uh, a psych psychiatrist friend of mine years ago. And I was explaining to him that I see these when I listen to music or when I'm playing, if I close my eyes, I see bubbles and uh, okay. like a lava lamp. Remember lava lamps going up and down? Yeah. I see them, but yep. they go inward and outward. 
And he said, oh, you've got synesthesia. And right. I said, uh, oh, am I going to die? And he said, no. <laughs> and, and, um, and he explained what it was. And, um, and that's the medical term for this phenomenon that uh, I've experienced. That's fabulous. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty incredible. familiar with it and because uh, I have a bit of it as well. Hmm. So um, anyway, you guys, I've had so much fun in this episode and it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you both and learning about your illustrious and very, very fascinating careers. Uh, and, uh, thank you. I want to thank our Sorry. current sponsor, Tomes, which is a natural sleep and sound healing portal, which can help you get to sleep and stay asleep longer. This piece of gold can be located on the web at www.tomes.com. That's www.t-a-u-m-m-h-o-m-s. Dot com. Once again, I'd like to thank my co-host, Mr. Gareth Dighton, and a special thank, you, thank very you to my distinguished guests, Mr. Steve Dorf and Mr. Milton L. Brown. Thank, thank you, you, gentlemen. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very you much for joining us. And, and thank you, Gareth, again, and make it an amazing day, an awesome tomorrow, and as they say in your country of Wales, no star. No star, you beautiful people. Catch up with you next time. That's right. And good night. Good night. Bye, Garrett. Thank you for watching My Right Stuff. This episode was brought to you by Tones, a natural sleep and sound healing portal available globally at www.tones.com. That's www.taumshoms.com.